Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe. Uh, best way to do that is to follow me on Twitter at, at Focused Compound. Uh, go to focuscompounding.com to get access to investment write ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005. If you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at Andrew at focuscompounding.com. So, Jeff, look what just came in the mail. You're watching on no. YouTube right now. Just came in the mail uh, late last night. Have not even read the first page. Uh, mm -hmm. Kitchens or sink. But I was just mm -hmm. flipping through it just for fun. And uh, do you want to explain what this book is? I guess for people that have not read it. You had recommended sure. that I read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a book by the sort of founder, in a sense, of Howden's Joinery. Um, uh, which is a UK stock. It is a um, supplier. They have depots. They supply um, by you know retail to the um, trade business, as they call it in the UK. So they supply um, people who actually then go on contractors and stuff who install kitchens and all of that. They don't sell to the general public. But you know, if you want to think like Home Depot, but for the trade instead of for the public, um, it's kind of like that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Kitchens or Sink is the book, How to Build a FTSC 250 Company from Nothing. Uh, I flipped to the back, and he has his top 20 rules for success. And I know I'm going to like this book because his first rule is you are always too busy to be late, which means that five minutes early is on time. That's something mm -hmm. I just feel in my core. There's <laughs> nothing I dislike more than when people are late. So me, I'm always like 20 minutes early, right? So if I'm on time, mm -hmm. call the police, call somebody. I'm probably, something's wrong. I'm always on time. Uh, and I think that's really important. Yeah, I think it's a great book. It's, uh, I don't know that people are going to like it because it's a very basic book. Uh -huh. It's very basic and realistic in terms of what actually gets stuff done. It's not a lot of theory, you know? Um, it's mm -hmm. a guy who didn't really know how to use PowerPoint and stuff correctly, you know? Um, but drew things on pieces of paper to illustrate the ideas and, um, yeah, but it's an excellent book. I would put it up there with, um, junk to gold, um, my father's business, some of the other ones like that, that are just very informative in terms of, uh, how much information they give about how the business really worked and, and, um, how it was really run by the organization. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why do you think it's good for investors to read books like this? You spend a lot of your time reading books on business, right? Accounts, mm -hmm. memoirs, I mean, almost like biographies, just business yeah. books, um, not investing books. Correct. Why do you think that is important? And why do you think more people should do that? Well, I think it's more useful. Um, it is mainly how I spend my time reading business books, not investing books. Um, I did read some investing books when I was much, much younger. So I've read most of the ideas of what could be said and that that are that makes sense. Um, a lot of investors don't know that much about business, so it would help to know a lot more about it. And um, one thing that investors have that business people don't have is we can obviously have a much, much broader range of knowledge than they can about different industries and things that work. So they tend to have very narrow knowledge about how things work now in this particular industry. But you have knowledge about how things generally work over time across a whole lot of different industries and a whole lot of different countries and everything because you see a lot more situations than they ever will. So you know some of the principles of it better. In some ways, being an investor can make you uh, better at business. Buffett said that, and that's definitely true. And I think that that reading about I, – I think the books that are best to me are – uh, books that are about individual people who built up a fortune and individual companies that were built up. Those are the two most interesting. Um, but I do want to warn people that I read differently than most people do. 
So I enjoy a book in which I don't agree with much of what the author says throughout the whole book. Um, I mark up the books. I take away my own things from it. So just a lot of facts and case studies and things are of interest to me, even if I don't agree with the general thrust of what the book's all about and everything. So I'm not that interested in reading a book that's a bunch of theory or someone's ideas about what works and what doesn't. I'm much more interested in just reading a bunch of anecdotes of their experience and different crises they went through and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then relating to other things, which is what I write in there, you know, is the connections to other businesses, other books that I've read, how this is similar and, and how it's not and all of that. Um, so, I mean, it wouldn't be unusual for me to cross out things and say, no, this is, you know, wrong and stuff, um, you know, that you want to make the book your own and, and get the most out of it that way. So, but there's, there's plenty of ones that I've read that are pretty interesting, even though they're not, um, great successes of how they, they went on to make a ton of money and everything. Um, you know, the book, the game makers, I was surprised by how good that was about Parker or others. Um, and that is very basically just a history of the company, but I guess the person who worked on stuff just had more knowledge of the industry and background and stuff than I realized looking at it. I thought it was going to be more basic someone who just writes books all the time. So really I've never yeah. even heard of this book, the game makers, the story yeah, you've of heard Parker brothers from, Oh, huh, interesting. Have you heard of the game Monopoly? Oh, it's my favorite game. Are you kidding me? Okay. My family so, just likes they they always tell me that I'm I'm too like cruel when we play that. And I'm like, the game is literally called Monopoly. It means one winner. I mean, come on. What what I mean, come on. They don't like playing Monopoly with me, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, so books like that I, I enjoyed. And I've mentioned, you know, uh, I think I mentioned the In and Out book that I thought was pretty good. Um I read the uh um, even the one, uh, the, on Tabasco, uh, the book McElhenney's gold, um, that was good. And yet that's a very dry book that probably isn't of a lot of interest to most people. And it was about a company that's been private throughout its existence. Um, but you know, I, I enjoy all of those kinds of books to, to understand how those things work. Um, some of the best ones are the retail type ones, but that doesn't necessarily translate a lot into our investing in what we, we can do. Um, they're interesting from the systems that they build up. Um, and so they're often the most interesting from an organizational standpoint, a culture standpoint, you know, those have the strongest. So I read a book about uh, Saul Price, Price Smart. Um, this is basically a precursor. It's, it's what Costco copied. Um, and that was very good. Read things about Southwest Airlines um, Howden, um, Tandy had things before it became uh, electronics thing and stuff. Um, you know, what became Radio Shack, um, before that also was interesting that way. Um, and then the ones that we mentioned, Copart and, um, my father's business was Dollar General. Um, those are all and made in America, the Sam Walton book. Um, mm -hmm. those are all interesting from the perspective of culture and everything. Cause that's all a retailer has is their systems, their culture. Um, and a lot of times it doesn't outlive the founder, you know? So mm -hmm. that's all that, you know, Howden's has is, is the idea that it had operationally of how it was going to do things. Yeah. So um, when you say systems, I mean, let's talk about that. What does that exactly mean to you? Right. And is that something that, you know, from take a quote from Munger, like take a simple idea and take it seriously. Is it as something mm -hmm. as, you know, low cost and we're going to have s systems around that to, you know, uh, you know, carry that out through and through is it more so like a system of uh, being decentralized or a system of incentivizing, yeah. you know, if it's like this mm -hmm. book, how to joinery, uh, the people running the marts themselves. I mean, what does that mean to you systems? And how do you think about like creating the right system? What does that mean to you? Yeah. So how to joinery has some similarities to like cap cities. Um, basically it was set up so that each individual location was run separately with pretty much total autonomy. They set their own prices and everything. They could do that because their prices are opaque. They're, the, it, it's like when you have an MRO company or something, it, the prices are seen on a special customer price by the people who are your customers, um, but they're not seen by the general public. So the general public doesn't know how big the markups are that they're passing on to them and everything. So that's a big help. Um, and so that allows you to focus on serving the, the customer the best, doing what you need to do with them um, and making the sales that way. Um, so yeah, they didn't have a standard layout. They could be different sizes or lay out their inventory in all different ways. They could charge different prices. They could do all sorts of different things because of how decentralized they were. And then, you know, you have like budgeting and whether you're hitting those goals, 
you know, they have some illustrations in that book about the graphs to track that on sort of a daily basis and stuff. But yeah, that's very reminiscent of Cap Cities. There's no good book on Cap Cities, but there was that one book I mentioned to you, Limping on Water, Mm -hmm. Um, which is not about Cap Cities. It's about one person's experience, which included being at Cap Cities as a manager for a while. But that's about the only book that gets into much detail on that. There have been chapters in The Outsider, articles written about and stuff, but not as much. But How to Join reminds me a lot of Cap Cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So we're going to talk about an investor that we've never spoken about on the podcast today. and It's actually based on an investing book, uh, John Neff, right? You had uh, sent over to me um, a a write-up that John Huber actually recently did, where he talked about a book, um, John Neff on investing. And he had some comments mm-hmm. towards that. You've spoken about John F. Uh, before in some of your earlier writings, saying that you think it's a book that everyone should read as an investor. It's an investing book that you would recommend. Um, and we could just walk through here. I mean, but you want to uh, give us a, a backdrop on John F., who he was, and uh, why you think he's an investor everyone should study? I guess he'd be thought of as a big cap value manager. Um, mutual fund manager of the same sort of era, kind of, of Peter Lynch. Um, that would be the best way people would know about him today. He managed a very large fund. And um, so we are talking about more traditional value, more diversification, all of that than people are used to seeing today. Um, but uh, yeah, he belongs to the professional sort of value camp in, in theory. Um but as the article talks about, there's not always necessarily as big a difference between him and Peter Lynch as people might think, but they would have been seen as being kind of opposed. He would have, if people thought of Peter Lynch as the GARP investor, they would have thought of John Neff as the value investor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he said, John Neff, two main points from the book, low P investing puts the odds in your favor and growth above 20% is risky. Mm-hmm. Um which is something that you've spoken a lot about. We've spoken a lot about on the podcast as well. Uh, but yeah, John Huber compares John Neff and Peter Lynch. Um, he says they are more similar than they are different. Both wanted good companies. Both wanted value. They both talk about low PE stocks. Both wanted steady and stable growth. Both employ simple common sense analysis when evaluating companies. Is this a good business? What are the prospects? Both investors seem to place value on the near-term trajectory of the business. Neff bought stocks that were low PEs, had temporary problems, but where he could see somewhat near-term solutions to those problems. Um, both seem to have fairly rapid turnover. Neff has mm-hmm. case study after case study in the book where he describes selling a stock after a 50 or 100% gain in just a year or so. Example, he bought Newmont Mining in 1981, sold it mere months later after a 50% gain, bought it again in 1982, and sold it again in 1983. He did this over and over. One stock he bought and sold six different times in his fund. That kind of Mm -hmm. um, reminds me of Walter Schloss a little bit, kind of, you know, uh, trading these names, flipping them, you know, and buying them back, selling them. Um, Have you ever done that in your career? Like been in and out of the same stock multiple times? I mean, you do, you do so much work on an idea and you, you, you kind Mm -hmm. of start to become more familiar with it. I mean, do you think that is a good way to, to allocate capital? If I was managing a huge amount of money and had to be very diversified, it's what I would do. But because you can't follow enough names. So at least if you know those kinds of things, then you could um, be in the in and out of the same stock. Um, it, it limits the amount of um, things you would have to know. You'd only you could still f- focus on those things that are your favorite things to invest in. Um, and then you wouldn't have to know everything else. Um, you're not gonna be able to reinvent the wheel and stuff. So yes, if you like want to buy a bank stock, then you'll buy a frost or something if you're a giant fund manager, because you would know that bank and like that bank and you say, okay, well, if I want a bank at this time, then that's the one I'm going to do. You're not going to spend a lot of time trying to do individual stock selection, picking out specific things. So if you like this gold miner, then you would pick that specific gold miner that you like a lot to repeat or that you know a lot about the story, you know, um, and I think that that makes a lot of sense, but I think that that is due in both their cases to managing a lot of money, being fairly diversified. That makes sense. Um, you're always kind of cyclical and stuff if you're in very, very big things. That, you know, there's, I don't think there's all that much like value 
of the ways that we think about it in very big stocks usually. Um, you know, of these things that you can buy and hold forever. It, it tends not to be the case. There's some great companies and there's some things that get cheap, but they get cheap for usually a brief period of time and then it changes. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any stock that Buffett has bought and sold multiple times throughout his career? Multiple times, yes, but not trading like that, just that he's revisited the stock over the years. Yeah, there's many examples of that. Um, you know, Geico, American Express. Um, Geico, just, yeah. Two of the most obvious ones, yeah. Um, but yes, he, he has done it. Um, but he, he did have high turnover in like the 70s and stuff. Uh -huh. um, he would sell things maybe at losses at times to buy things that were even cheaper. Um, and he did have a lot more stocks than in the very, very early days of Berkshire. Um, so there must've been high turnover at one point then. Um, and he did get out of everything except for like three stocks in the eighties, right around 87 or so 86. Mm -hmm. Early on in his partnership days too, his turnover was pretty rapid, right? I mean, he owned mm -hmm. way more than 10 or 15 stocks. I mean, I think he owned like, 20, 30, 40, 50 stocks at a time, right? Yes. Although like Graham, that exaggerates how much the diversification is because a lot of those positions are small because he couldn't get more of them, you know? Yeah. He mm -hmm. would have positions in the five to 15% range, which would be the biggest positions. And then he'd have, you know, stocks that are half a percent, 1%, whatever he could get of them. Um, but yes, that's true. He was widely diversified then when you could find lots of net nets. There's nothing wrong with high turnover. Um, the, there's stuff wrong with high turnover. It, I mean, here's the thing. If you're buying something because of the price and the price changes a lot and then you turn over, that's fine. That, that makes a ton of sense. If mm -hmm. you're buying something because you think it's a great business and you're in and out of it because you think the quality of the business is changing, that's kind of suspicious, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're a momentum investor, then your turnover has to be high because as momentum changes, you have to change. So um, it just depends on what, you're, what you select it for in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, if you select it on the basis of the quality of the business, the industry, whatever longer term projections, then I don't think that turning over a lot is the best idea. Um, but if you're doing it based on price, then yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we mentioned, uh, what do we, do? uh, we talked about like stock ideas and things, right? So I mentioned Vera Bradley from, uh, the beginning of 2023. So if that goes up 50 or hundred percent. I said it wasn't a good business. I said things weren't going well with it and stuff. So it would make sense that someone would sell it. Um, you know, if if you ever hear me say, well, it looks interesting because it's at price to book of one or something. Well, that doesn't mean that I'm saying it looks interesting. It's a price to book to two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's just totally different. Yeah. Do you think more of your returns have come from multiple expansion or the actual mm -hmm. returns that the business has generated? Multiple expansion. Is that more so because you just recycle that capital if you get that quicker flip into other ideas just, or what? It's just because unless you're in very, very specific things, multiple expansion outweighs growth by so much potential. 100%. Yeah. Um, now, I don't want to understate it. I'm more of a growth investor than people might think in that the actual earnings growth of the stocks that I've owned is pretty, I mean, not only is it, I mean, it's better than the market on average. Um, so it's just that even though it is better, the change in the multiple is a bigger factor um, because you're buying a cheap stock. Now, obviously the change in the multiple isn't necessarily a huge factor in some other cases in which the the growth of the company is really really high, but even then the change in the multiple in terms of sentiment is big. We, you know, we talked about Meta. Even if Meta was growing fifty percent a year, which it was at one point, the the change is bigger than that in terms of the multiple expansion contraction. So from year to year, if you were making money in Meta, you were mostly making it from expansion and contraction. Um, Tesla, I think, in terms of revenue growth, has always been, I don't know. 50 to 100 percent or something i don't think they've actually doubled in a single year usually i don't think they've gone much slower than 50 percent mm -hmm. and yet the stocks pe has probably doubled and halved at times in those individual years um yeah the 10-year kager revenue 70 percent and mm -hmm. that's just the kager over time um and eps growth i mean you're talking 2020 165 percent to 
2021, 665%, 2022, 122%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, crazy. Let's see. Could go over some more things that John had said about John Neff. Uh, he placed a lot of importance on business momentum. And I think that's, you know, kind of what you're talking about here as well. Like right? when you're talking about buying businesses that are, are growing and how people may not think you're as much of a growth investor as you are, right? You like positive business momentum. And I guess it depends, right? I mean, like, would you think about momentum differently in a, a stock that you're buying, like a great business at a reasonable price versus like buying a net net, for example, or to you, are they all one in the same? Just want to see it things depends. getting better. I, I, I'm a bigger believer in business momentum than people might think. Like when I said I would avoid, I mean, it depends on the price and it depends on how much damage it does to you. Um, but it, you know, um, I don't know that if I saw something in electric vehicles that was really cheap, I would be that eager to buy it. Um, if I think that next year things are the supply demand situation is going to be really bad. So I don't want to be in a business that's getting worse that way. That's been my problem with talking about Carmart. Although I talk about Carmart on the podcast, I've said for a while, the business is getting worse. I mean, they now are admitting that the business is much worse and stuff. And they kind of like talked about what it is, but for years and years, um, they've been extending the amount of um, the length of the loans basically. And that is a real deterioration in the underlying economics of the business when that happens. And there's ways to kind of paper over that and not worry that much about it as an investor, though recently investors have worried a lot about it. Although I think that's driven more by just people reacting to interest rate stuff and that throwing the stock up and down more than really thinking about the business. But um, yeah, it's not as good a business as it was five years ago. I mean, uh, five or six years ago, things changed in a pretty meaningful way. So I, I, do, I don't like any situation in which the underlying business, I think, is worsening more than the financial results. And I like businesses in which I think the underlying business, the the more um, the things that are not yet showing up in the financials are getting better. Um, so yeah, I like low inventory levels that people aren't taking into account that fact. I like that if people are cutting supply into the industry and that prices are more likely to rise and everything. Um, you know, so, I mean, the electric vehicle one is a really good example because um, electric vehicles in the United States cut their prices significantly and relative to gas vehicles cut their prices extremely significantly because average like prices on like used gasoline and stuff versus used EV, they went in very different directions. At the same time, the number of days of inventory on hand during the year basically doubled for electric vehicles, whereas it stayed basically the same for gas. That indicates soft signs, things that are not yet in the financial results in a sense that are extremely mm -hmm. showing you that there is, is um, way oversupply relative to the appetite of what people actually want. Um, and so that's similar to like meta. And we are talking about what worried me with that is that there were signs of a loss of engagement by people and stuff. I mean, so they got into other businesses and the company, the stock has turned around and everything. But when you have a decline in that, I think at one point, teenagers, something like 75% of teenagers said that they spent a significant amount of time on Facebook. And then within a couple of years, it was 30%. So that never happens in TV, in movies, in it doesn't happen in newspapers. Um, mm -hmm. Nothing like that happens in terms of a key demo dropping like that. And so that's very worrying. And so if you see that happen before something goes wrong with the stock, then that's what I mean about business momentum going in the wrong direction and business momentum in the other way. We talked about that with movie stuff. I said, like, look, if studios don't change, if they keep releasing the way they are to streaming for much longer, then I would avoid movie stuff. Um, they stopped doing that, but there was a year there with Warner Brothers and stuff where they seemed to be willing to put everything on streaming, even if it made no economic sense for them. If they keep kept doing that, then that would change the business forever. So you can see that ahead of time and you have to worry about that. And business momentum the other way is when you see them coming in and doing things that you think are smart. And um, that may take some time to be reflected in the uh, company's results. So yeah, the, you want a more leading indicator. And so a more mm -hmm. leading indicator is like, how is it perceived by customers? Um, all of that stuff. You don't want to invest in something where you go and you're worried, like, look, you know, what we talked about with Walmart and stuff during COVID, right? I mean, you could see the inventory piling up. I would not want to be in a stock where I can see the inventory piling up.
Mm-hmm. Um, How do you think about like inflection points? That seems to be more of a buzzword in modern times. Do you think about it at all? Is that something that's important to you? I mean, by definition, if it's a inflection point, it's not probably priced into the stock. Does that mm-hmm. uh, matter to you? Do you think about that often? Yeah. I mean, there are stocks that I've looked at and thought, okay, well, what does... The problem is the recognition by the market versus the recognition of the time in the company's um, financial results versus the recognition in like um, of when we would see that it's going to happen or something. So it's hard to say because it depends on the efficiency of the market and everything to understand that. Because I was talking to someone about like NACA, which, you know, who knows what things will happen, but they might have better results they certainly would think that they have better results in a year or something than they did in the past year and they've been basically explaining that for almost a year or something you know um but i said look honestly there's no evidence that the stock is efficiently priced at all so if you want to wait six months into the middle of 2024 before buying the stock because it isn't until earnings releases come out with new guidance and new reflected in the earnings and then i think maybe whether it's quantitative stuff or whatever reacts to the fact that the stock goes up on news over a few yeah. days after the earnings thing. And it detects that I think people aren't sitting around analyzing the business and stuff. So truthfully, yeah, you'd be early. If the moment that you <laughs> detect it, you get into it Yeah. now in Facebook, uh, you know, meta, um, at the times that we're talking about, you have to be really, really early because everyone yeah. is focused on it. And so the moves in the stock happen before the moves that would I would ever be able to detect in the underlying business, even if I was paying a lot of attention to it. Yeah, I think where I pointed out in cases where I think people are being unrealistic about it is like the electric vehicle thing, because they might be reading more media reports, which have a lag of they were all kind of thinking, I mean, you hire people to write green things and sections of your newspaper were going to have your, you know, your website and stuff were going to be about it. And um, you dedicated all this stuff to it and whatever. So it takes time for that to reverse. And so there's a lag, a halo, whatever, that people don't see. Oh, look what's actually how the reality of it that they would if it was a, a widget piling up at that rate. Um, they would understand that something's wrong um, if, if this was the timber business or something and they saw that that logs were piling up like that. So I think it really depends on how efficient it is. And I think um, article um, does talk a little bit about that, about whether things are, uh, about what works now versus what worked before in investing. And it's always hard to know because I don't know. And I also don't know that it won't be picked up and that NACO stock will respond faster than than later. But it's the kind of stock where I think it wouldn't. Yeah. Um, yeah, because there's just no evidence in the stock's responsiveness that we talked about that with with banks on the first day of the Fed decision. The bank movements don't make sense. Um, they're not correct for one bank versus another. They all move together uh, because whatever macro type thematic things are happening swamp the stock specific things. But then on days two, three, four after a Fed decision, they correct to uh, people who actually know the difference between how different bank stocks are affected. So it's, a, it's like an anomaly there that there isn't correct responsiveness to it um, on day one between interest rate sensitive uh, uh, banks in different ways, the ones that have different sensitivities on their balance sheet, asset versus liability and stuff. Um, But it is picked up later. So Mm -hmm. because I guess on day one, it's all just tagged as this is a financial, as a bank, it all moves together. And then later it takes more time for that information to, to happen. So, yeah, I mean, I think the inflection point thing, you can find it and sometimes we can predict it. The problem that I always have with it is the same as like, political things or something where people are like this party has a high chance of winning and they want to implement this policy and whatever. If you run the numbers, there's some chance they won't win. There's some chance that if they do win, they will decide not to go with the policy that they announced and you know, it'll get watered down or whatever. So it's really hard to see that how exactly that hits your stock. So betting like, Oh, I think Obama is going to win and that's going to hurt healthcare stocks. And Yeah. It, it turns out often that that's not accurate enough in terms of picking out that that's an inflection for your specific stock because it's too hard to figure out. None of those things is 100% probability. Mm-hmm. And so if our job was just to predict the inflection in the financial results, 
that is a lot easier than predicting when other people will predict the inflection of the financial results. And that's the problem. And it's very different depending on which stock people are looking at, which sectors, Mm -hmm. how fast people get that and how slow and how much they overreact. Yeah. I found that people, to your point, they want the inflection or the growth. Now they don't want to own something that they think will start to inflect in 2000, you know, second half of 2024, 2025, right? Like I was reading a, a, a write up on somebody was talking about movie theaters, for example, and uh, they were talking about, well, the box office in 2024 isn't going to be as great. So, you know, let's revisit this idea, you know, second half of 2024 for, you know, 2025 or 2026. Um, so it's, it's back to like the timing or the beauty contest when other people are going to start to think about it. But you do think about like the cycle of the the flows of, you know, how prices could move. I mean, if the sell side starts to, you know, upgrade it and give it better upgrades, then they're selling that to funds or whatever. Other funds are following it. And it kind of, kind of becomes sort of that reflexive thing, which is why I think a lot of people do focus and think like, oh, we don't care about it for 2024. It's going to be a 2025 or 2026 event of when we should focus on these stocks right and i'm not saying right wrong whatever mm-hmm. i'm just kind of looking at it from the outside in of why they think that way and why and and it could be the incentives too of you know multi-manager funds is like dominates uh you know hedge funds nowadays so they are so focused on next quarter as opposed to very long-term um you know outcomes in a company and the incentives there are well if you're down a couple percent or whatever like you're fired i mean i've even read stories of some Mm -hmm. people that have been at these funds for 10 years and then they have a drawdown of like 5% or something and they're gone. (laughs) You know, I mean, I couldn't imagine playing that game. So they do think very much next quarter or next six months, right? Yeah, and they write about it or talk about it. And this is something that people won't want to admit, but here's the thing. If you own a stock, a lot of times the answer is just it's cheap, something will happen. That's actually a good bet to make in markets most of the time. You're not allowed to make that bet if you talk about it. You have to make up a story about why it will go up in the next six months. I have no idea why it will go up in the next six months or if it will go up or what will happen in the world and stuff. But something could happen, you know, Mm -hmm. and that often is the right bet in terms of um, what you should be doing. If you could find many, many different ones to make and some of them will pay off that way instead of having a very narrow answer to what you need to invest in. Um, because I mentioned that like with CarMart, I wouldn't love that as a bet. I think that's kind of risky right now with what's happening with the business and everything. But if you did believe top down soft landing is a certainty, that's the stock. That's like the exact sweet spot of price and what's happened with the stock and everything. And that it's, it borrows short term to fund part of its balance sheet and is a totally in subprime auto and all of that. That is exactly the thing that you need to be in if you're betting all in on us on a soft landing. So if you start your letter to investors with we, you know, the team here thinks that it's going to be a soft landing and we've and we've arranged our, our uh, portfolio accordingly, then that's a great thing to put in it, whether it's a good bet or not. But, you know, like we talked about Alico. Um, nothing great happened with the business this year, but I think the stock was up pretty competitively with like things that are in the NASDAQ. You know, it it had a really bad year before the stock relative to like, um, you know, just relative to other stuff. So, um, cause at one point it was down in the low twenties. I mean, it was when we talked about it failing to file, you know, um, because it, it it didn't file some stuff on time and things since Mm -hmm. then it's been up a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I think Spirit Airlines doubled from its lowest point and it didn't double because people thought that it was much more likely to get a really strong outcome on the um, on its uh, court case. It, it did because it had dropped 50 percent on really bad results, you know, mm-hmm. so I don't know what the catalyst was. The catalyst is just sort of a reversion back to maybe that was a little overdone. Yeah. You know, I mean, I have a theory. I mean, huge price movements in stocks come from situations where something looks so absolutely horrible. The future seems so absolutely horrible. And then the transition to, eh, it's just kind of bad or it's, it's, you know, sort of neutral, right? You could have huge price movements. And that's why you look at companies that emerge from bankruptcy or, 
on the verge of bankruptcy and then to, well, things are just really absolutely bad, but like not so catastrophically bad where it's going to be a complete bagel. You could have huge price mm-hmm. returns from that. I don't know how you do it. I think it's a very hard game to do. Um, but, you know, if that company has assets or, you know, whatever, you're spending a lot of time on the balance sheet. Uh, I think huge returns uh, could be made. And then there's a manager that I think he does like sort of that in public markets where he focuses on like very levered companies that look like they're priced for dead, but he definitely spreads the risk around probably like a VC would or whatever. I mean, own a lot more stocks. Yeah. Yeah. So John Neff, I get the impression that he read like the Wall Street Journal and stuff all the time. I don't remember if he talks about that in the book. He might actually have mentioned that. I think he did mention that. Um, so that would be a way for a big cap manager to get a lot of ideas that way, because it's all about the, the, the talk, the pessimism and everything that's built into it. Um, you know, I, I have no idea why I would think that Magnificent Seven stocks wouldn't do well next year because of events happening. It's mm-hmm. just because of what's baked in, which is if any event possibly happens, it's not good because it, what's been baked in is uh, just perfection. I, I, yeah, everyone is, uh, you know, has a specific view of what the future is going to look like. And um, they're, they're sure that it's going to be that. And it it might be or it might not be. But I think things that are likely to do well on no news are sometimes, you know, the things to bet on because news might happen, but also just they will go up with no news, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And so, you know, he also did higher dividend yields. Um, Those were more common back then. Now there's so much more buying back stock and everything that that's not as meaningful, I think, as a indicator you know, and more cyclical type things sometimes too. But so did um, Peter Lynch. You know, Peter Lynch was big on the auto companies, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting, the many different ways to invest, right, in the market. Here you have, you can compare Buffett to Peter Lynch. I mean, they both liked growth, uh, low P's or whatever, but like the diversification, the composition of the portfolios were completely different. Um, But yet they both still had, I mean, incredible market beating returns. Yeah, John Neff and Peter Lynch, I guess, a little bit of a different from Buffett is um, they did like the low PE, like more on earnings basis stocks, whereas Buffett, I think, has tended to be high quality on the earnings, but more on the asset focus when he looks for for real value. Buffett is not driven as much. Uh, He has reasonable PEs, you know, 11 times or something when he has the earnings value type things but then whether it's oil or whether it's um, arbitrage things or whatever like graham he's much more focused on this idea of um assets giving you your um floor under the stock um you know and that is different from like low pe investing i think low pe investing attracts people more um and it's good when you're right. I'd say it's a little risky that some of the low PE stocks are, um, if you want to see like value traps, I guess, or whatever you want to put it, uh, low PE is a little more common for retail investors, I think, to fall into that than low price to book. Um, you know, because they price it off of like really high recent earnings or something that could go away, I feel like. Um, so that is a difference. And that's something that Lynch and Neff both, I think, lower PE, but lower PE with a cyclical bent, you know, makes a lot more sense if you're more tuned to what things are changing. And Peter Lynch obviously talked to tons of companies all the time. So he had his finger on the pulse of the different industries quarter by quarter. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I want to thank you so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. You can purchase the book, uh, John Neff on investing for $3 if you have a Kindle. Um, or you could buy the paperback for $22.51 on Amazon.com. Uh, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and I. If you are interested in learning about our money management services, you could reach out to me at Andrew at FocusedCompounding.com. Uh, be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us here today. Uh, and be sure to follow me on Twitter at, at FocusedCompound. That will be the best place to get access to everything that we push out into the investing universe. I want to thank everyone so much for all the support and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.